Yep. Are we live? We are just going. Yeah. Yep. Hello, viewers. Um, welcome to the first episode of Let's Talk Science series. Uh, this uh, part of the series is being uh, supported by Science for Society, Indian Humanists, Saha, South Asian Humanist Association, and Babu Guginini Humanists and Rationalists Arena Facebook group. So today we have a very special guest who wants to share his experiences in astronomy and science uh, with us, space science with us. Uh, before that, uh, let me welcome Mr. Sarat Teja Somina, our uh, regular science popularizer and member of Science for Society and BJ group. Welcome, Sarat Garu. Thank you. Thank you, Prasad Garu. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on the show. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, pleasure is all mine to uh, welcome Teza Begari, our uh, young astronomer, uh, uh, science enthusiast, and who is also a member of uh, BJ Group. Uh, welcome, Teza, for the talk show. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, our uh, special guest for today's episode is uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Jayant Murthy. Uh, he is one of the prominent scientists of the country and who is popularizing science among the common folks for uh, uh, its deep and better understanding. Uh, so welcome to the show, uh, show Professor Jayant. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. So a few, uh, a few points about uh, uh, Professor Jayant. Uh, he is a, a former senior professor uh, from Indian Institute of Astrophysics, and uh, uh, he has received a PhD in physics from uh, uh, John Hopkins University, Maryland, USA, and also joined there as a research scientist. And uh, uh, for over many decades, uh, he has been contributing a lot to uh, astronomy uh, uh, and, and the science in general. So uh, welcome, Jayant, again. And it's uh, really an honor for uh, 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 us to have you here today. You know, uh, I hope our viewers uh, will have a good time learning about your experiences in science and in astronomy specifically. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to uh, Sarat Garu who can uh, start uh, uh, asking questions uh, uh, and uh, people can leave their uh, you know, uh, messages in the Facebook live if they have any specific questions. Otherwise, uh, uh, let's go into the discussion. Uh, Professor Murthy Garu, uh, welcome again to the show. Uh, it's it's pleasure. It's our pleasure to have you, you here and uh, share your opinions and I and thoughts um, about various topics related to your area and others uh, to the viewers. And uh, so let's start with um, asking you something um, something you know with, within your area, sir. So what's the what's what do you think is the most exciting that's uh, that's happening in, um, in 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 our quest to understand our place in the universe? in the space by looking at the uh, space today? Well, you know, that's always a matter of personal opinion and it changes with time. But what I am most fascinated with now is the search for uh, planets. And when I was a student, there were zero planets other than our own, of course, other than our own solar system, zero extrasolar planets. And now we know 5,000 plus of uh, all different kinds, uh, big one, big Jupiters going around near the sun, uh, big Jupiters going around uh, near their parent star, maybe Earth, some planets that are close to Earth. And so this, I think, is the most exciting thing that's going on now. And hopefully JWST, which was just launched, the James Webb Space Telescope, will be able to tell us quite a lot about uh, the conditions on some of these planets. So we keep hearing a lot about uh, exoplanets. I think I think um, I think people have stopped counting how many exoplanets we have discovered. There, there are so many uh, exo there are so many planets out there. I mean, and I think um, and, and until like hundred years ago, uh, I believe uh, people used to think that we are the only galaxy in the universe. But now there are like more uh, more galaxies and more planets are coming along with it. What do you, what do you think of all this excitement about um, uh, trying to find Earth-like planets among these exoplanets? Uh, what do you think are the chances? I mean, what is your opinion on that? Of course, it is exciting, but what do you think about it? So if you, 
excuse me, if you ask me, there has to be Earth-like planets out there. There have to be extra, extra solar civilizations. How can there not be? It's such a huge universe. When we will find them, if we will find them, and certainly communicating with them is almost impossible just because of the huge distances involved. But uh, as soon as we find a civilization or another or life on another world, I think it'll change our philosophy. You know, where we've been built to, to think that we're, we're the only, we're, we're special. And this is one of the great revolutions in astronomy, the Copernican revolution, that, that it's moved the earth from the center of the universe to just one small planet in, in a multitude. And so that I think is, is exciting, that uh, this chance that, that we will learn that we're no longer special. I mean, we already know we're not special, but this will really bring it home to us if we can find a planet with life. That, that, that's, that's very optimistic, uh, sir. And, and, and I personally share that optimism. Um, what, what do you think when, um, when, when, when you know, people like uh, uh, you know, Professor Hawking, uh, the late great Professor Hawking, uh, uh, cautions about you know finding, um, trying to find alien civilizations, or cautions uh, when when someone else finds us. So w what do you uh, think of uh, those kind of things? Um, yeah. Say the the uh, Hawking, Hawking was of course a great man, but in in this case, my my own feeling is that is that it's just that distances are so great. You know, how long does it take to get us to get to, get to the nearest star? I, I don't actually know, but probably more than a hundred years. And, and so we just cannot imagine going, going out and, and uh, colonizing the galaxy. So where's the competition? If we meet another civilization, they're not going to declare war on us. It'll take them 10 million years to reach the earth. And so, no, I have no fear. I mean, after all, we've been sending out signals since the 50s. You, if you want to watch uh, the first TV show, Doordarshan from 1970, just go out 50 light years and, and you'll be able to watch. So we've already been communicating. What's the big deal? That, that, that's interesting, uh, uh, Professor Murthy, because um, but th because I, I think I, 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 even you know, a great share of uh, astrophysicists and a great share of Physicists, uh, uh, in particular, they 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 are really optimistic about us finding, and uh, there there is this. And do, do you do you uh, share this optimism that we, after all this bloody history that we had, you know, the bloody history, the, the history with blood, where, where we colonized humans, went ahead and colonized other parts of the earth. Uh, do you think we are we are better as as human beings because of the scientific revolution, because of the things we have been knowing, and because of uh, trying to understand our place in the cosmos that we would be. Uh, making uh, we are somewhat morally different than uh, the people uh, 400 years ago when they set out uh, to conquer, um, you know, the Atlantic, the lands beyond Atlantic, and so. You know, experimentally, I think Russia has shown that uh, we we are no different than uh, than we were 400 years ago. But where I think that we, I, I think it's just a practical problem. I think that uh, there, there is no way that we can significantly move out into space. Even if you look at Elon Musk and his plan for colonizing Mars, it, it's just not going to happen. Not, not without some really significant uh, advance. You know, we're, we're on the earth. The earth is made for us. Or, or rather we're made for the earth, the other, the other way around. We're made for the earth. And we, we don't have any, uh, any place to go. So, so yes, we can send a base out to Mars. Yes, we can maybe even send people to Pluto. But as far as major colonization, it's just not going to happen. Just, just too much, uh, too much, F, too much uh, uh, resources. And I say this being a, being a great fan of golden age science fiction. It's just not going to happen. That, that that that's a very interesting uh, you know thing you shared about yourself, sir. That uh, uh, that you, you are a fan of uh, golden age science fiction. I, th I think I think we'll come to that. Uh, that's I think something mm -hmm. that uh, yeah that's uh, we'll come to that. Uh, but you 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 you're saying uh, you know it's it's difficult to colonize and it may not uh, happen uh, in anyone's lifetime anytime soon. So so the sense that uh, that we are getting is that you know uh, 
the earth is ours uh, and then we are made for earth and earth is made for us as you said and then um, we are made for earth rather we evolve to be you know uh, fit yes, exactly. within, within the within within uh, we, we we can adapt only to earth it seems uh, so um so as far as uh, so we have to preserve the earth then uh, and so on but and when it comes to this uh, when and when we whenever we see a lot of uh, budget is being spent on space programs where we try to uh, you know, search for, uh, we try to study other planets. There is this frequent argument that comes, I would not call it criticism. Uh, there is this argument that comes that, you know, when a country like India does it, India is a poor country. You know, we have a lot of poor people uh, who are uh, not able to eat three square meals a day, even today. But do you, do you think, do you think uh, whatever, what do you think of this argument that, you know, whenever uh, something happens, whenever we do something great in space, like we, uh, we do uh, Mangalyan or something like that, and then this argument comes that you know we could have spent this budget on something else. We could have spent this money on something else. So, do you think uh, when we explore the space, when we explore the planets, uh, do you think we are we are just uh, th that just goes? I mean, that's orthogonal to uh, poverty alleviation or or these pressing needs. W what is your opinion on this argument? So, let me argue on several different levels. The first is that it's a tiny fraction of our overall budget. India's science budget including ISRO, including DRDO, everything included, is 0.7% of our total GDP, compared to about 2% in the US and uh, Israel is something like 4%. So, so our, our, the total amount of money spent is just, just tiny compared to the overall budget. But more importantly, or, 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 or let's put it more economically, you, you've we find that uh, studies have shown that the money you put into research goes into stimulating the local economy. For instance, you know this in the US with Silicon Valley. Where did Silicon Valley come from? It came from Stanford and Berkeley. In India, you know it because why is Bangalore the high tech city of India? It's because of ISC and because of all the engineering colleges around that grew up because of it. Education and research leads to, leads to uh, uh, this high-tech investment. And so it would be my argument that if you spend money on basic research, you will find that the ancillary growth, ex again, experimentally, we've shown that the growth is, is multiplied. So I, I think in a country like India, we cannot afford not to spend money. We have to spend money on basic research. I think I think that, that the, the point you stressed uh, that we cannot afford to not spend that we have to spend it. Uh, I think that's that's I think that that's very poignant. I think uh, it, it's frequently said that you know uh, rich poor countries in the past have become rich countries by investing in science and technology. So investment mm. in science and technology leads in that direction. Yeah. It's not yeah. forgetting uh, the problems of the poor country. It's actually yeah. inventing solutions to that. So I think that's uh, that's wonderful. Yes, yeah, yeah. So uh, a question here. Um, yeah, Prasad, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's uh, good to know that a lot of technology universities and uh, uh, um, uh, curriculum has been uh, uh, prepared around the you know skills and other things like the professional skills. Uh, but what is your opinion on uh, uh, the importance of having more flexibility? Uh, in the curriculum at colleges and universities, uh, like you know, liberal art universities, and uh, you know, not just uh, you know that directly help the technology uh, driven industries, but also more in terms of uh, you know um, arts and liberal art universities and colleges in India. So uh, I, I'm biased because I, I my background is from a liberal arts university. Johns Hopkins is the oldest university in the in the U.S. And uh, uh, so the, uh, uh, what I believe is that you, the, the university system or the edu higher education system in India, to some extent, the school system, but I, I'm actually not so, uh, I, I think the school system tends to be too rigid after 10th in yeah. that you're forced into, into a narrow sp specialization. Some student asked me yesterday, and uh, if, you, if you like mathematics, you do PCM. If you don't like mathematics, then maybe you do biology. So you're, you're already segregated and 10th is too early to, to make those decisions. 
Yeah. So uh, the university system or the higher education system in India, unfortunately, I think that it's more intended to give people a job. You're, uh, it's it's a, all a, a compact between the students, the teachers, the faculty. Everyone knows the education doesn't matter. What matters is what is how much money you get at the end of it. And uh, and I think that's hurt us. So. Uh, uh, the, the a, a true liberal arts university. We're seeing some of them. I, I you know, I'm not a big fan of of Ashoka, or, or uh, I, I think that they. I, I'm, I'm, well, I shouldn't say that. What I should say is that uh, I think they could have done some things differently. But in general, I, I think that the purpose of education, a purpose of higher education, should be to teach us to learn. They, they should build that lifetime search for knowledge into you. And that I think we fail to do in our current higher education system. Yeah, everything is uh, centered or focused around, uh, you, know, uh, you know, jobs and earning and, uh, you know, how to use science yeah. for a better livelihood than to understand it and uh, apply it for the betterment mm. of the society. And I must say that that getting uh, sending an SMS to the students' parents if they don't come to class is, is not the way to teach people to be adults. <laughs> yeah, and uh, one more question, um, uh, going back to um, the space exploration. Um, so uh, what do you think, uh, like with the entry of private players like SpaceX and uh, other uh, other uh, uh, third party, uh, you know, further profit uh, companies uh, uh, to venture into the you know, space sciences and uh, uh, what in your opinion is going to be the future of like, you know, commercial space machines, uh, missions or uh, 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 further profit companies to be involved or have a lot more stake in, in, in the astronomy and space sciences? So in the US, it's always been private industry driven things like Lockheed Martin, Ball Aerospace. These were the companies that actually built the rockets. NASA didn't do much building. Uh, so what, uh, what a company like SpaceX has done, and one should acknowledge the government funding that SpaceX got to keep them alive at the beginning. But what they've done, and, and the new private companies, is to, uh, is to make space access to space so much cheaper. And this, I think, is a great thing. We're still in the infancy of this new, so-called new space, this private industry into space. And I think it'll take some shaking down. I, I, don't, think that, uh, I, I don't think that astronomy, you know, the trouble is that we still need money from somewhere. Even if we want to launch on a private space guy, space, per, on a private space enterprise, that's still going to take money and we still have to get that money from somewhere. And so I don't think science is going to drive the private space industry. They have to find their own niche and uh, they have to find their own profitable areas. And some of them certainly have. Planet Labs has this uh, 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 company in India, uh, uh, what's, what's their name, that does uh, agricultural research, Satsure. These companies have found their, their niche and they're, they're doing good work and they're sustainable companies. Many of the others, I don't know. I don't know if they'll survive. And I don't imagine that, uh, that we will get that much astronomy. But I will tell you one thing that we are doing. We're building, in, in, my, in my lab at IA, we're building small missions. So we have a mission on the Chinese space station next year, which uh, the opportunity opened up through a UN program, the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs. And we proposed for a, for a small star camera on an, on an Emirates mission. So these kinds of opportunities may open up and that we'll, we'll still have to see. It's still very new. Thank you, sir. Uh, so over to Sarath or Teja, if you want to ask any questions. Uh, Teja, do you want to ask uh, Professor Murthy anything? So I already have one question in the chat asking, I have chose physics. Uh, I, Arya says, I have chose physics, chemistry, and biology in my 12th, and I do not have mathematics in my 12th. I want to be an astronomer. Is it possible to be an astronomer without having mathematics in my 11th and 12th? That is the question. 
Yeah, let me not comment on your school because uh, uh, whether, whether you need that formal mathematics or not, I, I, I don't know. You will need mathematics in order to be a physicist. Whether it comes through your 11th and 12th or whether it comes through your learning later on. And also I'm not familiar enough with the, uh, uh, with the BSc system to, to know how not having mathematics will limit you. So that's something you'd need to think about. But practically you will need mathematics to, to do astronomy or to do any, any hard science. Yeah. So there's also another question saying, uh, how do citizen scientists mean a deal to science? So do we need citizen scientists in astronomy or how are they important uh, for you know, any kind of science and precisely in astronomy? I think it's very important that we involve people who want to do science, who, who want, even if they can't do it full time, even if they can't do it as a profession, I think it's very important that we include them in our activities. Now, the difficulty is that uh, a lot of the work that we do is, it, it needs that, uh, it has a fairly high entry bar. Maybe we use specialized software, maybe the techniques are, are, uh, are, are learned over, over a lifetime. So there's, there's a high entry bar. Some, ages, some uh, groups have done this very successfully. So for instance, this uh, planet, uh, planet hunters, for, where people look for planets in Kepler data, or Galaxy Zoo, where people try to classify galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. These have been very successful, but they've been a, a special effort. I, I have had a fair number of students from uh, colleges and from, uh, uh, yeah, mo mostly from college, colleges of one kind or another, who have done summer projects with me. And so that, uh, that certainly we have. As far as a for, if, if uh, an amateur wants to get into science, someone who does a science maybe at night, I think that's a perfectly feasible thing to do, but it's hard. And more so now than before, I think, uh, it, you know, because of the availability of the information at the fingertips for anyone with an internet and a computer, uh, and also the emergence of the technologies like machine learning and artificial intelligence. So uh, I think yeah. we have a lot, lot better uh, chance of, uh, you know, or the um, uh, ease of getting into uh, astronomy, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, especially the opportunity. Yeah, to, yeah, especially about uh, you know the, the the faster computers and 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 uh, the data that we have now. Um, so yeah, we, we are at a better, we are at, in, in a better time now than ever, I think. Uh, no, especially in astronomy, we very much embraced this open access to data and to publications. So yeah. all of our publications, uh, you know, 99% of our publications are available. Anyone can read any of our publications and any data from any major mission is also accessible. Even from our own missions, smaller missions, we will make the data available immediately. So everything is there. So, so that's, a, that's I think it's, a, it's a matter of collaboration. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's a matter of uh, having a better uh, connection between different people who are actually working independently or maybe because you know, scientists usually that the, the notion is that, you know, they tend to work, I mean, especially, you know, the individual scientists, uh, you know, they tend to work separately or, you know, they are in their own uh, world of things. And, uh, you, know, they, you know, especially like the situation that we were in for the last two years, like the COVID and all. So we lost that personal connection, uh, which is much required for, for, for scientists, I think. Yes, that's certainly true in a way. Uh, scientists, uh, uh, in principle, now we, we can just work from home, but but you do lose that connect with uh, with people. Yeah. And most science today is collaborative. You do it with yeah. multiple people. Yeah. Go ahead, Sarath. 
uh, I, I think it's it's pretty much extending uh, the same point you made, sir, uh, just uh, before that. You know, uh, the the amount, the level of collaboration, um, and being uh, and being accessible in open fashion, having an open accessibility in astronomy. Um, so, do you think do you think it's more in astronomy this this uh, open access than in other areas of uh, research, area, other fields in physics, or even other fields in basic science? Do you think astronomy does this more? Um, we, we have done it more, and this is largely because of NASA's influence, because uh, NASA from the beginning, uh, well, from the beginning, they've always uh, uh, put, they've always allowed access to all of their science data. And this has, uh, this has expanded out to, to most, most other missions, telescopes, and now uh, big agencies like NSF, like NASA, they mandate that you have to release your data. Just a good astronomy thing is probably better, yeah. especially like NASA sharing their uh, technological breakthroughs with the commercial oh, yeah. players in, in uh, primarily in US and uh, you know and across different countries like you know that resulted in a lot of spin-offs uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you know byproducts that we use almost uh, daily like then I think uh, uh, last time I read more than two thousand. Uh, products in all walks of life, like you know, in healthcare and military and, and, and education and, uh, and the kitchen appliances. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. So we have, yeah. So so it's not going to. Uh, it never went waste. Like the money that they spent, uh, because that helped in advancing some technologies that we take it for granted now, like in telecommunications and weather forecasting and and, and a lot of other areas. It is very hard to disentangle the impact of basic science on, on technology, but certainly I, I, I do think that uh, without basic science, you, you can't advance much. I, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the examples might be cherry picked, but even so, I, I think you have to have that foundation of basic science. Indeed, sir, something, something as uh, ubiquitous as laser today in, in modern industry, that is, it's purely uh, was uh, uh, theoretical physical physics work from. That's right, out of Bell Labs. Bell Labs, yeah. yeah. But but I think that we we we're a little dangerous when we try to pin down specific things like that, like like lasers or like X rays, because then you you uh, there there's a lot of academics by by which not just science but history, geography, which don't necessarily yield better life a better life for us. And we shouldn't devalue that. We shouldn't devalue the uh, a, a true understanding of, uh, of Indian contributions to ancient science, for instance. You know, not, the, not the kind of nonsense that you hear, but, but what is the real contribution? What did, they, what did Bhaskara really do? Something like that. So where does, uh, uh, yeah, uh, with, with, with recently, who gets the credit wars that are going between uh, <laughs> Europe and India, uh, it is indeed interesting that a lot of uh, ancient, uh, it's not even really ancient, it's like when, when you consider like 11th century, 12th century mathematicians and astronomers from Kerala. So uh, mm. this actually is, uh, I think this point is pretty close to the collaboration, what you talked about and, and astronomy being more collaborative. So do you think historically astronomers and mathematicians, especially these two areas of basic research uh, have been more collaborative because a lot of ideas seem to be going from the Malabar coast, uh, that the trade route through, uh, you know, to, to, to Persia and then to uh, through Mediterranean to, uh, to Europe and then ideas coming back when we see all these things going on. Ptolemy's work was rediscovered by Arab um, astronomers and then he went back to Europe and there are a lot of traces of that found in, um, you know, the work that was done contemporarily in, in India and again, a lot of ideas from India, they went back to Europe. What do you think? Uh, so, uh, uh, so has astronomy been collaborative? Is there like a uh, for, historically? Do you do you see? Do you share that view sir, that astronomy, mathematics specifically have been more collaborative than say medicine uh, in, in ancient times? So it's very hard for me to pinpoint discoveries. I mean, we we tend to think in a linear manner. Pythagoras' theorem. Pythagoras was the one who discovered the theorem, but we know that's not true. The Babylonians had some idea of the of the theorem, or maybe they they had they knew exactly what it was. So when we talk about science and it's, it's a web, 
There's um, discoveries happened at many different places, different times, and clearly everyone talked to every, everyone else. So, so there was communication. Gunpowder went from one from China out. Paper went one way. And so there was this constant communication. And so where where what or originated uh, is is very difficult to pinpoint. But I'm sure that that you cannot take one region and say uh, say that it did not contribute to something. And I, I'm pretty sure you cannot take any discovery and say this came only from here. There must have been some sort of chain linking it to so many other discoveries and people and discussions. So so I think I, I, I think it has to have been collaborative in some sense. That, that that's that's very interesting, uh, uh, Professor Muthi, to hear that. And when you so so then when you hear these uh, claims where uh, there is there's this game of one-upmanship coming in that you know it has it should not be, I mean say, saying that you know uh, science scientific uh, the history of science should not be Eurocentric is one thing, but to say that we have done it first, uh, I mean we we did it earlier than yours, or we have done we have did we did it even in a more advanced version than yours. And you were just copying us, you know, when that kind of slander mm -hmm. comes. Uh, what do you think? And when, when especially this kind of slander is difficult to talk to in a crit I mean, to, to, crit uh, to critique and then, you know, make people understand, you know, that, you no, know, this is this is how we should, in, in the way, manner you told that it is like a complex web of collaboration and uh, things came from many places. And uh, what do you think when uh, there is this uh, crazy levels of one-upmanship going in, in the name of, you know, supremacism and stuff like that? What do you think of that? I think it's very dangerous because uh, it, it, uh, it, what it does is it makes us devalue the, our, our, own, uh, our own ancestors. So now you hear something ridiculous, like, uh, like they, they knew about uh, spacecraft, they went to Mars. And then you question whatever else comes out of this. So the, we, we have to put everything in context. Of course, something like that is ridiculous because, because engineering, is something like a space as complex as, complex as a spacecraft or, or an airplane that needs so many other things that we know that they couldn't have done it 2000 years ago, just because you need so many other things and to fit in. We know that that's a modern thing. Where I think, so what I think it does is it, it uh, we doubt everything that we hear about the greatness of our own ancestors. And I think this is wrong. We, 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 if we put things in context, what did they really do? Mohenjo-daro is a great, great city. I mean, modern sewage and, and whatnot. And so let us understand things in the context of their times without trying to really say, okay, Mohenjo-daro was more advanced than Athens. That, that doesn't really matter. It's all independent. We should appreciate each achievement for its own uh, uh, for for its own relevance and for its own importance we, we so i'm Mohan just Daro interested had, in the history we we, we say mohanjadaro had uh, closed drainage you know concealed drainage right, and right, right. many towns i mean and, and in india even today they don't have that we mm. still have open drainages mm. so mm. so do you, do you think we, we just we just glorify and then we just we just say you know we, we just glorify and then we we bang the thali you know but uh, but we don't really do anything much about it we don't really take the sort of inspiration that we have to take from them. Do you, do you share that view, sir? Uh, no, absolutely. Or... There was a great tweet uh, a, a while ago which said, uh, we're, we're so busy glorifying our ancestors that we forget about doing things in the present. That's, that's, that's brilliant. That's, that's a brilliant uh, uh, thing to say, sir. yeah. Uh, Teja, do you have any questions um, um, to ask Professor Murthy? Um, so I, I'm getting quite a lot of questions here because I said that uh, Professor Moti is already going to be there. And one of the questions says, uh, whenever this, uh, whenever we know that some kind of asteroid is going to hit Earth or, you know, something is going to happen to the humankind, uh, we can't obviously go and stop it. And um, why do we exactly study astronomy when we can't do anything about the threat we get from space? What is, the, what is the reason to uh, know about the universe? And after all, why is it important for us, for a human being to know about the universe? 
the, the what I try to do is uh, it, it's we we want to learn about the universe because it's what makes us human. It's not we don't want to learn just for just to know what we can do about it. We want to learn just for the sake of of uh, learning. <clears throat> and this is where I I, I uh, again come back to the idea that uh, it's not just astronomy. It's not just biology or medicine or, or it, but it includes academia in general it includes history it includes philosophy these are all ways to to place ourselves in the context of the universe and why do we want to do that you might as well ask why or why do people want to listen to music or why do people go to see movies it's uh, it's what keeps us it's what makes us human what makes us human is the desire to learn our curiosity our uh, desire for new experiences. And so this is why we need to, we need to do this. We, we, need to, we need to do blue sky research, things like astronomy. Yep. I have one question uh, with your uh, area of interest, uh, Professor Jent. Um, so I came to know that uh, uh, one of the areas of study that uh, um, you were associated with was interstellar dust. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, for our viewers, like, uh, how do you explain what this interstellar dust is? What is it made of? How do, which color is it? Uh, does it look or uh, where are its origins? And uh, what, is, uh, what is the importance of uh, studying about interstellar dust uh, to humanity? Yeah, again, when you look at importance, I don't want to play that game because uh, it's it's one where where you say that this branch of science is more important than that branch because somehow it's relevant to humanity. Whereas mm -hmm. I like to take the the holistic view that that every branch of science or every branch of knowledge is important in itself. We do it because we want to learn. Yep. So uh, uh, so interstellar dust. Uh, uh, where it comes from is all of these questions are, are unknown to some extent, but we think it comes from the outer envelopes of, of uh, late, of, of uh, elderly stars. So stars that are close to dying, they have extended envelopes and the atmosphere is kind of, is quite cool there, maybe only a few hundred degrees, uh, a few hundred degrees Kelvin. And so it's cool enough that, uh, cool enough and dense enough that you can get complex molecules forming. And so somewhere you, you get dust molecules form and then they go out into space and then they uh, accrete material, material comes onto them and they get bigger or they come near a hot star and they get, they, some stuff evaporates off. So there's a constant evolution there. Uh, some part of uh, the interstellar dust comes back into stars. So if you look at a star like, uh, like the sun, the sun has a lot of uh, hydrogen, it's mostly hydrogen and helium, but there's also a lot of other elements like carbon and oxygen and so on. Where did these come from? These came from the interstellar medium, from interstellar dust. When the sun gets old and dies, it sends out material back into the interstellar medium. If you look at us, we're even more, uh, even heavier elements. We're, we're uh, hydrocarbons, oxygen, nitrogen, and so where did this come from? This, these came from supernovae. Supernovae exploded and they sent out all these elements into the interstellar medium. And then they came back and they formed planets. So, uh, so that's, uh, so in a way, in a, in a very real way, we're all made out of interstellar dust. Uh, we were made out of stardust. Yeah, I think uh, 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 Carl Sagan or someone in his earlier 80s cosmos it could Said be. The same it thing. could be. <laughs> so it we are stardust. So it's so it's become a, a trope. Even even uh, 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 I don't use that word exactly in its own meaning, like the you know a, a spiritual sense. Uh, we are all connected, not just the living things. Like the all matter is you know it, it it's recycled. Like everything mm -hmm. again you know, becomes dust and then or like you know stardust and then and then starts farming and collecting. And uh, so what, what are the methods or the technologies that uh, you use to, to observe and study interstellar dust um, on a regular basis? 
So interstellar dust is far away. So it's hard for us to go out there and measure it. There have been a, a couple of missions, Rosetta, and uh, the first one was Stardust, where they went out and uh, they tried to, they went out to maybe uh, a few hundred million kilometers from the earth or maybe a hundred million kilometers from the earth. And they tried to get incoming dust. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they've made some, some discoveries. But most of what we do is based on observations. And these are observations primarily in the ultraviolet yeah. and in the infrared. So you have to go outside the atmosphere to do it. And what you will do is that you observe it. And uh, then based on what you observe, you, you then model it. This is astronomy in general. Astronomy is built on models. You observe something, but you can't change it. You can't set up, and, and this is what, in a, how astro astronomy is different from most other areas of science. You can't actually set up an experiment. You can only observe what is already there. And so we observe it and then we build mo models of greater or lesser complexity to try to understand what we see. And, and so that's how we do it. We, we get observations from spacecraft and then we build models to understand what we see. Um, I have one more question before I hand it over to Sharad. Uh, so with uh, all these observations, like we send a lot of stuff into the space, uh, uh, especially into the lower Earth orbit and, uh, and medium range. So all these telescopes and satellites, like they have an end of life and you know they end up uh, becoming what we call it as space junk, I think. Uh, so uh, uh, I think uh, NASA currently is tracking at least over, I think, at least a million uh, pieces of space junk uh, that are more than more than few centimeters in size. Um, uh, so what do you think is going to be the future for this? Like, is, will it naturally, uh, slowly enter into the atmosphere and burn out? Or uh, does it become a really big problem in the future uh, for, for the future uh, uh, space missions? So there's two aspects to this. One is the space debris aspect that you talked about. As we put more stuff in space and as more stuff dies out, there is more, more uh, junk in space and the chance of collisions is much greater. We've already had a couple of, uh, I think two collisions, two major collisions, which destroyed satellites, which of course then pumps more junk out there, yep. uh, which makes it more dangerous. The space station has to move every now and then these, uh, is, uh, all satellites have to move every now and then to avoid the space junk. So that's one problem. They are trying to think about it. Uh, some of these uh, ideas are going up and sweeping up, sending a satellite up to sweep up this debris. Um, whether that's commercially viable or not, I don't know. Now, most uh, satellites, uh, they, they have to have a deorbit mechanism. So once their end of life is reached, they have, to, they have to go back down into the atmosphere and come back down to the ground. Hopefully they, they burn up before they hit the ground. So that's one aspect. The second aspect is the impact that these have on astronomy. And so you know that uh, SpaceX, OneWeb, they all want to launch thousands of satellites or maybe tens of thousands of satellites. And what this will do is it will fundamentally change our night sky. When we look up, we expect, we, for, for uh, ever since humanity started, we look up and we see a natural sky. We see stars and that's our connection with, with, with nature. It's our connection with the heavens. We see, we, see a, we see stars, we see constellations, we see galaxies. Now with all these satellites going up, now what we, we look up and we'll see these satellites. The sky will be completely changed and so even with the naked eye, you look up and, and the sky will be different. And we've already invested so much in big telescopes to look out to the edge of the universe. Something like the 30 meter telescope or, or LSST, the Vera Rubin telescope. So the, these telescopes, they, they're, they're, the impact of these satellites on these telescopes is, is quite, uh, quite harsh and even more uh, optical telescopes, yes, because you can relate to that. That's what you see. But radio telescopes, you can think of all the radio chatter that's going on now. 
it's becoming increasingly hard to do any astronomy from the ground. Um, I, I have a question, sir. Uh, when we know that uh, the universe is expanding and uh, we know that uh, things are moving apart, why is the Andromeda galaxy and you know uh, the Milky Way is going towards the Andromeda? Like, we know when the universe is expanding, then why are both these galaxies, Andromeda being around 2 million light years away from Milky Way, why are they uh, getting closer? No, you have to distinguish between large scale motion and small scale motion. And the universe is so large that Andromeda and the Milky Way are actually quite close to each other. And so there at that close range, gravity still predominates. It's only on the very largest scale that you have to worry about the universe expanding. Uh, we're not expanding, right? We're, we're, we're staying, staying as uh, discrete objects. So it's only on the largest scale. And it's just that the universe is just so large, unimaginably large, that, uh, that, that the local group of galaxies, which is what Andromeda and, and uh, Milky, the Milky Way are both part of, that's, that's all still gravitationally bound. Yeah, and I have a follow-up question. Say, uh, how can one promote astronomy and deepen astrology? So how can I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, how can one promote astronomy and debunk astrology? You know, this is a very difficult thing to do. I've been on TV with astrologers and uh, it, it turns out it's very difficult to argue with them because they have no commitment to the truth. So we, as scientists, we have to tell the truth all the time and astrologers don't. And so they come in there with their, uh, they come in with stacks of books and uh, they, they say, oh, look, this experiment, that experiment, and you know that all of it is junk. So, uh, so no, as a, as a practical matter, uh, we, all we can do is talk about good science and hope that uh, enough people believe in good science as opposed to bad science. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, go ahead, Sarath. Uh, so sorry, I, I think um, uh, you, you just said uh, scientists have a, um, have, have a stronger commitment to truth. So, and, uh, and I think commitment to truth and uh, telling the truth and being truthful and truth itself, the value of truth itself is uh, somewhat diminishing, seems to be diminishing mm. um, due, to, due to various things. So this makes me ask you, uh, do, you, do you think we don't have enough scientists in, in areas other than science, like, like say politics, for example? I mean, politics is dominated by a lot of lawyers. Uh, do, do you think, do you think uh, more scientists in politics could do well with, uh, with, with the idea of a modern society that is founded on uh, recognizing the value of truth? I, I have a great uh, belief in the ability of scientists to look through the, uh, to look to the core of a problem. What I don't have a great belief in is the ability of scientists to take into account real concerns in doing so. And so I think a technocratic government can be quite dangerous. And you see this in these, all these software guys out of Silicon Valley they come up with great software solutions that don't really work because they don't take into account the complexities of, of society. So uh, I, I think that it would be very useful if politicians had a scientific think tank. But I think that that think tank should then, it should then work in a consensual manner that uh, you, you need to have people who understand, who go to, the, go to the public, talk with them, understand what their concerns are, and in your implementation, you make sure that you don't forget about all of that and just don't do the, 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 the straightforward technical solution. But, you, but at the same time, you have people like, uh, like, like Angela Merkel, uh, who has a PhD in, uh, I think, quantum chemistry or something uh, mm. in, 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 in a basic science. And then she, 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 she has been the leader of the entire free world for some time, for quite some time. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so do you think uh, scientists can do... Um, because of their scientific background or because of the values in their career, uh, in, in the study that they've done, they can, they can contribute well into politics as well. Uh, so do you think they would, uh, they, they would be a good fit in, in the political landscape as well? Uh, I think it has to depend on the individual scientists. I don't think I would like politics very much 
because uh, simply because uh, uh, because there's too much talking. So you have to have people who who are comfortable with talking to other people. You uh, you you. I I think that that uh, as you say, I think that that a good science background is very useful because it teaches you to cut to the to the to the truth. But then you you know you have to work with people. You have to convince people. So, so I'm not uh, I'm not sure that the best scientists would make great politicians. That's that, I, I think yeah, that that's very interesting thing to hear. Especially uh, in the current electoral politics, like you know, it's very very hard to get at least one scientist elected uh, because mm. uh, you know the the mindset and you know the common people, um, you know, uh, I think. Uh, uh, they don't see you know more into the future and what actually they are doing is other uh, short term benefits and <laughs> it's a very unfortunate situation everywhere in the world like yeah getting the support of people is different from um, getting the right person into the job but i do think that expert opinion that you should always ask for the yeah. expert opinion i think that's very important yeah, I think uh, yeah, that's one thing that worked even here in uh, um, Australia and New Zealand and and a couple of other mm -hmm. developed countries where, irrespective of uh, who becomes the leader, even if they are like hardcore Catholics or you know mm -hmm. they they are anti-vax by their uh, by their uh, beliefs or nature, uh, once they are in public life and once they are in position, uh, they do hear to the experts and uh, you know. Um, uh, take their advice and uh, value the evidence and data rather than what they personally believe or feel. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, uh, that culture should be there for any for any nation to actually, you know, get a lot more close to the truth and uh, 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 evidence based uh, 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 truth than than you know uh, uh, taking people into uh, fundamentalistic ideologies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one question on a related note is like, uh, um, with the current uh, developments are, uh, or you can say the conflict and war across uh, um, different places on the earth, especially with the major superpowers like Russia, uh, wherein, uh, uh, you know, even in, uh, even in the past, uh, a, a lot of times, you know, if we exclude that cold uh, cold war period, like the space war time, uh, many nations came forward uh, to address uh, major issues like you know the vaccination in seventies and eighties, uh, uh, etc. So there is a, there is a need that you know uh, certain missions uh, uh, for certain missions to get succeeded. Uh, nations even you know when they differ politically have to come forward. Mm. Uh, but the situation right now uh, we can see is leading uh, uh, into a disastrous uh, 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 situation every day. Uh, so what do you think uh, uh, this might have an impact on the future collaborative missions between different countries if, if this situation goes too far? You're always, it's always a, a question <clears throat> and of course, uh, there have been some, uh, uh, the, whether the sanctions on South Africa, uh, which, which helps bring down apartheid. And so there, there, are, uh, there are times when I think sanctions are certainly warranted and times, uh, uh, times when they may actually do some good. Uh, in general, the idea is that uh, in sports and in science, one talks to everyone, one collaborates. And even throughout the Cold War, there's uh, the International Society, uh, COSPAR, which was a committee for wh whatever it was, for, but basically for, for space cooperation. And that continued. People were talking on uh, both the Soviet and the American sides. Uh, scientists were collaborating on uh, nuclear, uh, the, nu the nuclear arms talks. Again, uh, scientists from both sides were collaborating. And so I think it, they, that, that these collaborative activities, something like polio or smallpox, yeah, yeah. then wonders. These yeah. sort of collaborative activities, I think, do have, do have the potential to, and have 
actually reduced tensions and have done some really wonderful things. Uh, let's hope that the Yeah, over to you, Sharon. Okay, sorry. Oh, Sharath, you are in mute. Sorry, I think you were that. Sorry, I was speaking on mute. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think uh, yeah. So, uh, so Professor Muthi, you you talked about um, you know how uh, technocratic societies uh, can be uh, can, are are bad, and then um, it brings me that you know uh, it it reminds me that you know a lot of sci-fi, a lot of science fiction, especially the golden age science fiction, they feature uh, technocratic dystopias. Uh, uh -huh. So. That that brings me to ask ask ask, ask you this question. So, uh, how did uh, I mean? Uh, what what's your what's your uh, who's your favorite sci-fi author, or um, what's what's your favorite sci-fi work? What would you recommend yeah. uh, you know audience to read? So, like I said, I, I I'm a big fan of the Golden Age science fiction. So that's, so that's uh, Asimov, uh, Arthur Clarke, Heinlein. Uh, this gang and, and that had a that that science fiction had an innocence about it. They, people really thought that we would go expand to, throughout the solar system. Uh, we would get uh, all sorts of great stuff. So that would, that, that is, I still think, still my favorite part of science fiction. I think a lot of the more recent stuff, it's become more dystopian, as you say, and uh, try to be more, uh, less, less happy literature. So, so I would say my, I still go for the old golden age stuff. So why why don't you like the more recent ones? I mean, what do you find? Uh, they were, um, uh, uh, the golden age was way better. In, um, in it was in, a more optimistic time. time. More optimistic. They they really thought that science was the uh, science was all good. Now we know that science may not be science may have negative aspects too, but at that time they thought science was was the answer to everything. Big technocratic solutions. You know, we, let's build big dams. Let dams be the temples of modern India. You, you know, this sort of stuff. And now we know that dams have their own problems. They, they're ecological disasters. Uh, so, and uh, it was a simpler time. So, so would you say something that works for, uh, for a lot of people would be better than something that works? Uh, I think that's the difference. Like, like I, I think that it's it's a complex that that science that technology can be complex, and so we see that you know you Amazon Amazon is a great thing, but we know what it does to to small stores. Everything has has ups and downs, and in the fifties and sixties they didn't they didn't think that they thought that science was it. You have good science that will lead to utopia. Now we know that uh, you know you have uh, you you have technological wonders that lead to uh, lead to lead to global climate change. So not not so easy. And and what do you think of um, what do you think of sci-fi films? Um, and uh, with 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 I mean uh, so uh, so uh, we had you know films like two thousand one space odyssey or things like that 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 were more focused on themes and. Now you have films like Interstellar, which are totally all out on uh, you know, depicting black holes. And uh, and a Nobel laureate Kip Thorne was uh, was one of the science consultants yes, for the yes, film. Yes. So have you watched that film? What do you think about the black hole uh, and and all the astronomy that was uh, uh, you know uh, in the film? I think people have I, uh, op are totally opinionated about it, and we totally respect that. We want your opinion on that. <laughs> I personally didn't like Interstellar too much because that is just too confusing. I liked uh, the Martian much more, uh, and uh, of course, I mean, if you ask me what what I really like, I like I'm, a, I'm a big Star Wars fan, oh. so uh, I, I've seen every one since uh, since the first one in 1977. So, uh, but but Interstellar itself, I, I thought they went too much for the special effects, too much the, the black hole science. I mean, yes, Kip Thorne did all the equations, a Nobel Prize winner, but. Do are there really wormholes in space? No, probably not. 
I think in one of the last uh, previous uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's talks, he was mentioning about uh, gravity, the movie Gravity being more close to uh, the reality than mm -hmm. than any other science fiction movies where they Which one? dealt with gravity. Gravity, I think. Gravity. Yeah, right? yeah, sure, uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Except that Sandra Bullock didn't have to let uh, George Clooney go. She could have <laughs> held on to him. Save George Clooney. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we've seen a couple of movies in uh, Indian uh, films as well, especially even in Telugu. I think a couple of years back we had a movie, uh, uh, some moon uh, mission movie. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, more and more movies should come like that. Yeah, yeah. I but haven't seen that movie or Mangalyan. I haven't seen those movies, but uh, I, it's a. I should be encouraged. Yeah. So, oh. so are you are you so satisfied? I mean, uh, what do you think of uh, the popular depictions of um, you know of scientists or or of science related uh, films? Say, for example, there is this trope that you know there is this scientist who does an experiment goes haywire and you know leads to a destruction and stuff like that or um, you know that common trope or you know you, you see sci-fi films uh, bad sci-fi good sci-fi uh, what do you think uh, what, what do you think uh, should be the popular uh, way of uh, representing science or astronomy or scientists uh, for that matter in in art and film do you, do you think they do a good yeah. good i mean do you think it's satisfactory today what artists do or do you think it could be better in indian context at least I think some of them, like uh, uh, which one was it? The Mission Moon was it? Where where uh, one of the uh, maybe Vidya Balan, where she makes puris while while in the mission control. That center. was Mangalyan. 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 Okay. Mangalyan. That was ridiculous, uh, and it's demeaning to to women. So I think they should treat scientists as professionals. And and not try to add these little touches. Oh, she's a woman, so she has to make puris in the <laughs> control room. That was so ridiculous. So I I, I object to that. Uh, I think uh, you know Shah Rukh Khan in uh, uh, what was that movie? Yes, as, as Swadesh. Where, where he, Swadesh. 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 I, yeah. I, I thought that was a pretty good representation. Here's a guy who works at NASA who comes to India and has this great idea for. Uh, to build up, what is it, a check dam or something? Yeah. Uh, I thought that was good. So I, I have no real problems. I just think that uh, that they should treat scientists as professionals, but that's all. I think uh, Sarath is uh, being too optimistic uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because uh, in, in quite recent times, like I have seen or rather heard about many movies which popularized pseudoscience, Mm. <laughs> and uh, you know mm. supporting them as if uh, you know um, someone can prove reincarnation in a court scene for example uh, yeah. and many other movies in in very recent times like you know uh, i don't know what is happening with the movie community as well like uh, either they want to um, uh, ride on the right wing uh, wave that is uh, across nation or especially even in india uh, and make mm. money out of it i have no idea but uh, um, I believe they will be on the wrong side of the history going forward. And uh, if, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I don't know if uh, Indian movies have have science consultants on them, like Interstellar had uh, Kip Thorne, or like The Big Bang Theory had had the physicist who was consulting. I don't know if Indian shows have that. I think it would be a it would be an excellent yeah. idea. Yeah, should be. I think we can. Yeah. So, sir, and and I think I think uh, we I think we can um, I think if we don't uh, do we have any questions, uh, Prasad or uh, Teja? Do you have any questions? Uh, nothing in specific from my side. Just only one thing is, uh, um, what do you think, like uh, uh, Professor, about the current budget from the central government? Are they enough for studying space or uh, you know doing space missions that are required? uh for 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 india uh now and going forward like uh, what's your opinion on that like uh, uh, what is required for the indian society as we discussed earlier as i think as a first question like you know we can't afford not to spend there so are we spending enough or um on, on science specifically yes so science. they 
uh, they, there, there's a, it's a slightly complicated answer. There's, a, there's several things. One is that the Indian government, the amount of government support is probably comparable to most other countries. Where countries like the US really add is private investment into research. So whether it's pharmaceutical research or whether it's automotive research, they contribute seven, maybe two to 3% of the GDP. It comes from private companies, comes from industry. And we don't see that in India. In India, the amount of private investment into research is, is, uh, is not, not high at all. I don't want to say negligible, but it's certainly not high. So that's one aspect. The second aspect is that the uh, research funding we get, whether you count it as reasonable or not, is uh, uh, we have a fairly small community, and I think we could always use more money in a phased manner. Let's, let's look at people and say, can you spend more money? It won't be very much. You give every scientist as much money as they want. It just won't be very much. Uh, and, um, but more importantly, I think the, we're, we're, our, our science budget is severely misallocated in the sense that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's unfair in the way it's allocated. So the university system, where most of our students are, gets very little money. The uh, a few elite institutions like my own, the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, ISC, the IITs, they get the bulk of the funding. And so the funding is very skewed towards these few elite institutions. And now the problem is increasingly that we're forced to, uh, to comply with government rules. See, government rules are intended for the Department of Roads. You want to tender a road, then naturally you want to have so many safeguards, you want to go for lowest cost and all that. But in science, that doesn't really apply. We want, to, we want to get the best available. And we ourselves understand cost and all that, but we want to get the best available. We want to get something that actually fulfills our needs. And, and you know how vendors are. I, I, I had this case where, where I, I tendered for uh, 15 computers and I forgot to put windows in there. And the guy tendered without windows. And so because of that, the, the guy was the lowest cost. And I had to cancel the whole tender and retender. And you get things like these. These are just complete uh, bureaucratic nightmares because that's not my purpose. I'm not, I'm not a stores manager. I, I'm a scientist. I'm just trying to do my science. And so this is where I think the biggest impact would be if the government would see fit to release us from these bureaucratic nightmares. As the PM said, the PM said the scientists should focus on... Uh, on doing science, not on, on, um, on whatever it was, on, on account management. Uh, and this, 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 I think, is what would help us the most and putting more funny, money into the university system. Yep. <coughs> Shil, do you have anything more? Uh, I, think, I think we can, uh, we can end with one question, uh, the last question, sir. Uh, uh, I mean, we wanted, we, I mean, we just want, we just reserved this question to the end. <laughs> what made you, I mean, what excited you to become, uh, to study uh, science coming to basic research and specifically into <clears throat> astrophysics? And, uh, and uh, why do you think the students today um, need to motivate themselves to come into basic research? Yeah, it's a hard question for me. I, I uh, was always interested in science from the time I was, uh, I don't know, five years old. We used to get these small ladybird books. I don't know if you, if you know of them, but they, they were uh, books aimed at five or six-year-olds and uh, uh, maybe eight-year-olds, and they, were, they had basic explanations of science. So you've got, I, I, and so that was one of the things. So from the time I was, I was a small child, I, I always wanted to know about things and I always read things. So if you look at, the, you look at my bookshelf, half, half of those books are fiction. Many of them are science fiction, or some fantasy, but many of them are also science books and history books just because I want to know. And, uh, and so that, that, that's me, right? I, I don't know if all children are like that or many children are like that. I don't know if people would recognize themselves, but I always wanted them to know about things. 
I, that, that, was, that drove me. About astrophysics in general, uh, one part of it may have been, uh, when I was eight years old, I watched Neil Armstrong land on the moon. And so that's as good a impetus as any to go into astronomy. But a lot of it is based on where you go, I, I, on what college you go to. So I went to Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins had a good astronomy program. So, so it, it's a complex mix of factors. But always I wanted to know, I wanted to, I wanted to, uh, I, I knew I wanted to know about things. Maybe the same yeah. curious kids in India that they, they, uh, they want, they might want to go into basic, I mean, they don't even may not know about basic research, but they go into software engineering of all yeah, the no, areas. I know, <laughs> and which can be very interesting too. Uh, I, although I don't, I don't know if you, if you're a low level person at Infosys, I don't know if you're really doing groundbreaking stuff. But, uh, but there are, I don't want to limit it to astronomy. There's lots of sci areas that, that you are actually doing new things. And I think that's what we should strive for, just for doing new things. Uh, that, that's what, uh, the, the thing, the difference between doing it as a profession is that in many ways, you now lose the beauty of, of why you went into it in the first place. You know, a professional astronomer looks up at the sky and they look at it with different eyes than an amateur astronomer. And so, so now you want to, you, you don't necessarily have understand the beauty of the universe. You want to understand how the universe works. And a lot of what we do is day to day. You know, we sit at the computer. I don't go to a telescope and observe. I sit at a computer and work through my programming, work through my day. Uh, and so, uh, so it, it's, a, it's a profession. I think this is what many students don't understand. And uh, even when they come into astronomy, they don't understand that it is a profession and that you really have to put in your eight hours a day doing regular hard work. It's not just sitting there and, and dreaming about uh, equations. You, you actually have to sit there, work through, do the programming, make sure that the equations are right. It, it, a, lot of, a lot of drudge work, but it's all worth it because suddenly you see something and you say, hey, I, oh my God, that's how it worked. That's, that's how you make sense of it. So that happens far too little, but that's what, that's what we work for. So students have to be prepared to till the, till the field, till the ground. <laughs> you have to do a lot of work, a lot of work before you get the reward. So, so curiosity, uh, looking to do new things and uh, being prepared to do the hard stuff to till the land. I think those are the Absolutely. takeaways that you want to give uh, to the audience. Uh, you know, so that they can, they can come into science, they be, can be curious, and then always look to new, do new things in whichever area you are. I think that's. But I have no regrets. I have no regrets going into science, even even if my uh, even if my uh, peers, uh, even if they go, they travel first class and stay in expensive hotel rooms. I have no no regrets. No regrets. Uh, that that's that's wonderful. That's brilliant. I think that's uh, um, that, uh, you, you, uh, that's very insightful. We have. I mean, you uh, gave your insights, and it was they were very uh, poignant and they were deep and thoughtful, uh, Professor Murthy. Um, yeah. uh, and and uh, it was a wonderful time talking to you, and we thank for your time. And uh, Prasad Garu, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, that's so inspiring as well at the same time and uh, hope it helps uh, uh, a lot of uh, our audience uh, and uh, you know to venture into the science uh, and uh, the various fields of science and uh, and uh, you know there is nothing that can beat the sense of achievement and uh, you know uh, self uh, 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 satisfaction that comes uh, mostly from teaching and science related uh, professions especially rather than you know working um a nine to five uh, for a company uh, i'm not undermining uh, any effort here but uh, uh, but uh, you know that's what scientists offer here like you know uh, so thank you very much and uh, for participating in our uh, let's talk science the first episode of it and uh, you know for sharing and uh, for uh, for sharing your valuable experiences and opinions on various uh, subjects uh, related to science not just science and uh, you know in general uh, so that's all for today. Uh, thank you, Sarit, and also Teja Bagari uh, for joining this uh, call, and uh, especially for Sarit Garu. I think it's uh, half past midnight for him in Canada now. 
so we'll get back uh, to you in another uh, episode with uh, another amazing guest very soon uh, until then goodbye and have a nice day thank you goodbye thank you thank you sir goodbye